like an idiot, I decided to have a little bit of a midweek session. I decided to have a little bit of a midweek session. And now I've regrettably woken up from a two day or two and a half day hangover, <laughs> right? Kind of a little bit feeling like it. And I've now come to the sad realization, the really sad realization that gear is just not for me anymore. I might have to just hang it all up and do it, what, once a year, twice a year when I go to Berlin or something, because I'm always out. But if I'm indoors, if I'm out and about town here in London, I just can't do it. Simply cannot. My body cannot handle it the way it used to be able to handle it before. There was times in my life, drugs aside, just for the drinks, listen to this, just from the drinks alone, the beers alone, there were times in my life from the beers alone where I used to be the master of the pregame. I would be going, like, you know, I'd be leaving my house to go to the clubs, and usually where I live in, you know, the part of London that I live in is very much outside of all the major cool parts of London. All the places that everyone wants to be at, I'm not there, right? So it's kind of like a little bit hard to kind of get to places. But the good thing about it is that it creates some distance and some time. So you can whack on a mix, you can get on it, you can have a little bit of a smoke, and you can grab a beer. And what I'd always do, I'd love doing, especially when I when I would go out on my bike or even just go on a bus, is that I'd walk like as far as I could and then maybe continue the journey on public transport. But I'd walk with the aim of like listening to some tunes before I'm going to the night out, grabbing a drink at every off license I stop at, aka Bodega. <coughs> <coughs> oh shit. Sorry about that. <coughs> Got some ginger stuck in my throat. So I would walk to every stop, right? And I would get a flipping um beer. And this is why I used to drink only beer when I'd go out because it's the cheapest thing to drink. I didn't want to spend too much money on, on liquor. And also I had a thinking of I'd rather buy my beer cheap and then buy my liquor in a club expensive, if that makes sense. It doesn't really make sense, but that's how I kind of use it in my head. So I'd be drinking down the street and I'd legitimately sometimes I'd buy, you know, the pack of four beers they have. I'd have those four tins and I'd be necking them all the way to the next shop. And sometimes I'd get two rounds in. So I'd have four cans. Plus whatever I do in the club, and I'll be completely fine. I'll come back home, a little bit hungover and stuff, recover after the day, back to my regular schedule programming. Nowadays, I can't even finish a four-pack of beers at home. If I tried to buy those things, they, I'd have to kind of dump them in a bin. It's never happening. So that whole era of me being able to drink as much as I needed is gone. And then when it comes to the drug side of things, it's really kind of bummed me out. I'm not going to lie. Because this is me having to now understand and accept that I'm a completely different person, um, physiologically. And um, I just can't handle the same amounts I used to handle before. It's probably getting to the point where I might have to just quit full time, all the way through. I'm still not getting to that point yet. I don't want to accept that bit of it yet. But I have to definitely accept that I can't be having any sessions at home or any sessions in local clubs around here because most of the time the time wise isn't the best for me because I feel like personally I'm too spoiled for my trips across Europe and stuff I need a good six hours to rave but then I'm also not leaving my house at 9 p.m to go and party I refuse to do that these clubs want you to get into club before 11 p.m for free entry you can go shuck your free entry up your ass you know what I mean I'd rather pay 30 pounds and go at 1 a.m than turn up to a club at 11 p.m or 10 p.m like a donut I'm not doing that so that limits the time that I have to party. So it's basically on my own, it's my own fault. So I have like a four hour window to get, to get funky. And then I'm getting there and you're chasing the high and it's all weird and it's musty and it's not a great thing to do. So I realized that I can't essentially do it here. So I have to go do it when I go abroad. So every time I'm doing my little techno tourism stuff, that's when I'm going to get on it. But it, I have to be honest, it is quite bittersweet. I'm kind of feeling a little bit sad about it because it's the realization that I've changed. It's a realisation that I'm not the same person that I was before. And maybe part of me rethinking about it too. I was kind of meditating a little bit. I was thinking to myself, you know what? Part of the reason why I'm a little bit bummed out about this whole, like, I can't handle the same levels of drugs I used to take before. is because as much as I tell myself this narrative that I like to go to clubs just because of the vibe and for the music and for the dancing and for the culture and the scene and the music and the blah, blah, blah. Maybe... The actual reason why I was going to clubs was so I could get fucked. And maybe I never admitted it to myself. Or the other thing could be that I'm scared to find out that when I start going to the clubs more sober, I start to realise I don't really give a fuck about clubs like that. Which is weird, isn't it? I'm sure people like that do exist because I, I love the scene. I love the music. 
So maybe there are people who exist who just stay at home, right? And just watch streams online or, you know, check out some people's videos on Instagram. And that's about it. But they don't bother. They're not really interested in going to clubs. I wonder if people like that exist. Same with concerts. I wonder if the people that exist who maybe will never go to a live music concert, but listen to a lot of music at home. So they, you know, imagine they're fans of fucking Harry Styles. They love Harry Styles, but they're never, ever going to go see him on tour. They're just going to see clips of him performing sometimes on Twitter and stuff. And that's it. That's where it goes. And then they're just going to keep moving on. Maybe that's, maybe people do that. But when it comes to clubs, I feel like with DJing and with dance music, that's why I compare it a lot to comedy and stand-up, stand-up comedy, whatever, right? I honestly do think, right? Stand-up comedy and clubbing are the same because a large part of how you enjoy a stand-up comedy show and a large part of how you enjoy someone's DJ set is actually being in the place, in the club, in front, around, surrounded by people who are into, into the same thing, the speakers, the smell, the ambiance, blah, blah, blah. That adds a lot to the overall experience. Legitimately adds a lot to overall experience. Um, you, I don't think you can... Like, I don't think you can get a real grasp on somebody's funnies or somebody's ability to DJ without actually seeing them play live. My opinion, personally. Which may explain why people's, why the whole mix series thing isn't as big as it once was in yesteryears. Because people would rather go and experience these things and it's an excuse to go out. Maybe I'm thinking that. Who knows? But, for sure, at, on this moment, at this day, as we're currently speaking, which is what, May 20th, sometime in the evening over here in London... Unfortunately, the drugs is over for me, man. The sessions over here in London are over for me. It's done. Unless I have opportunity to rave for six plus hours, like I do when I go to Berlin and stuff. And I have to be honest, like this is something that is the God's honest truth and something that is so weird to me that I still have to fucking realize it in my health. But I am usually on my bestest behavior when I go out there. A lot of it has to do with it being a holiday and a trip. You spend a lot of money. And obviously the culture around the scene over there is a lot, um, it's kind of hinged on your ability to behave yourself in a way because you have to get into the club first. So it kind of puts you in the right state of mind. You're not going there like as a lad kind of thing. You're kind of going there like as a patron of the arts, a patron of culture, a patron of nightlife, right? That goes into it. But legit, I'm on my bestest behavior when I go clubbing in Europe, when I go clubbing in Berlin and stuff. That's the times where I'm on my bestest behavior as opposed to when I'm here. So um, unfortunately, that kind of bestest behavior, I feel like is a lot more, it's, it's, you know, it works better over there because there's more time to rave. It doesn't work as well over here because there's less time to rave. And honestly, my body just can't handle it. That's the long and short of it. My body just can't handle it. My body has changed for the better, for the worse. I'm going to say for the better because I do prefer it when I just had my blinkers on. I was just running 100 miles per hour, doing anything that I wanted, just knocking shit down. I'm sure it's dumb to say this, but I do. But now we're in this era we're in now. I'm working from home on a laptop. I spend most of my time in front of a desk or on the fucking laptop in bed. Do you know what I mean? Like I how much distance am I walking day to day outside? Not much because there's not places to go unless I'm going for a weekly meeting for work or whatever. Um, running is the only time I'm really kind of doing a lot of distance in terms of steps outside and shit and getting your heart rate up only up into the gym. So there's a lot of sedentariness involved in my life. So I have to kind of insert these moments of like going out and doing things. So it's a bit annoying, that realisation, because part of it's like, okay, maybe you're going to start going to clubs and you're going to start realising, rah, man, maybe you don't like the scene or clubs as much as you thought you did. Because, you know, when you're sober and you go to nightclubs is when you really, really test if you're about this life or not. Because no one can deny being in a club or even just a bar, even just a house party, even just a family dinner surrounded by people who are fucking drunk is the, one of the worst things ever. It legitimately will fill you with dread. And you start to question your life choices. You start to, everyone around you starts to look really ugly, especially if you're sober. You're like, Ugh, get away from me. Your face is fucking drenched. Your body smells like cat piss. Like, you're just like, go away. Stay away from me, all right? But it kind of is what it is. It is what it is. I have to kind of accept it. And um, yeah, man, I got to accept it. This, this is the new me. The new casino goes out sometimes from time to time but for the most part i'm gonna be the fucking old guy in the corner with my arms crossed like criticizing people's mixes mm, i would have i would have bought the treble in a bit more there mm, lower the bass a bit too quickly mm, you know the you know what do you call it um sonically that wasn't quite right mm, 
What's this about? Hey, who's this? I'm going to have to be one of those like chin strokers in the corner. That's who I'm going to be now. I can't be in the middle sweating my face off on the ketamine, on the yay, on the pills, on the lead. I can't, I can't be that guy anymore, especially not here in, in London. I just can't do it in the UK. I just can't do it. I can't do it, man. Body can't handle it. I need an actual 10 hour plus window. Of like getting ready, having a couple of bevies like I do when I go to Berlin, walking around, going to the park, reading a book in the park, laying on the field, looking all cultural and shit and super intellectual, getting up, going to go get a fucking um, Lamushun at a local flipping Turkish spot, saying what up to the guys behind the counter. They instantly think I'm American because some reason all Turkish immigrants that live in fucking Berlin think all black people are from America, <laughs> regardless of how my accent sounds. Walk down the street, bump into the other couple of black boys that see me and give me the dirty look like, oh, I'm the I'm the only cool guy in Berlin. You can't be here. Look me up and down. Walk back to the Airbnb with my fucking bottles of beer rattling around in my little bag. Put them up in the fridge. Go out to the flipping club. Queue, waiting there, shaking, hoping the guy in front on the door is going to think I look gay enough or queer enough or weird enough or alternative enough to let me into the fucking dance sass myself up a little bit you know and then i get in then i get in then when i get in the first thing i do is i dump my fucking coat in the fucking cloakroom and i run straight to the toilets straight to the toilets baggy open let's go that's usually when it works right because that's a good four to six hour window before i hit the clubs where i'm just revving up but if i have to go from my house to the clubs and have to be there at 1 a.m. or I plan to be there at 1 a.m. I can't do it. Unfortunately, I can't do it. My body just doesn't allow me. And I'm absolutely bummed. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna sit here and say, oh, this is the best thing that could have happened to me. <laughs> I, I, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it, man. I really do. I always talk about how hard it is for adults to have hobbies. Especially now, you know, when you're older and stuff and you're not really beholden by what your friends do. I feel like when you're younger, you're kind of, your, your interests are sort of dictated by what your friends are doing because you just want to hang out with them. So if your friends play football, you play football. If your friends, I don't know, uh, like to go doing, play knockdown ginger, you play knockdown ginger. If your friends like to do graffiti, you do graffiti. So yeah, once you do get some type of hobby, it has redacted. And that's really destructive as going out basically is and doing drugs and drinking is because let's be honest, it's not the best for your ears. It's not the best for your body, for your heart, for your nostrils, for your mouth, whatever you're taking the drugs, it's all not good for you. Drinking, all of that's not good for you. All everything around it, the sound, the volume, it's all bad. But, but it is still a hobby. It is something that you do outside of your work, outside of seeing friends and family that brings you joy, that allows you to connect with people. Like I've legitimately made the most friends in my adult life based. No, I've made the most friends in my adult life. Yeah, this is the thing. I think I've made my most friends in my adult life outside of streaming and doing a podcast. So big up all you guys. Um, but outside of that, it's been from nightlife. It's all been from nightlife. It's all been from getting fucked up. It's all been from being in a toilet somewhere, sharing a baggie. It's all been from being in a club somewhere, buying someone a drink, getting some shots together with some random. It's all been somewhere, being on the way to go to some fucking after hours, on the way to a forest rave, at a record store, at a fucking, you know, live performance type thing, whatever. Like, all of those things have been the only times when I've actually made quote-unquote friends. Outside of that, nah, because I don't play football as much. Um, I used to skate a lot. I haven't skated in years. I cycle a lot, but I'm doing that on my own with my headphones in. And the last thing I want to do is be in a crew of other cycle guys like in, in a fixed gear group with our butt shaking in the air cycling. I hate group activities anyway. So I run a lot, but I, I do that on my own. I fucking abhor running clubs. I think running clubs are incredibly G-A-Y. The thought of running down the street, like having a conversation. So Jill, what have you been up to? <laughs> that fucking, I just want to punch people in the face that do that. Go fuck off, right? So I hate that. So every part of my life that would encourage me to find friends or go with people, I generally kind of pull away and do on my own. Same goes for the fucking, um, you know, street wear and fashion shit. I don't really attend events like that like I used to because I don't really like the people in the scene. I kind of like to enjoy it from afar like a, like, a, like a consumer. I'm not really bothered about being involved and stuff and being part of it and all that malarkey. It's not really for me. So everything that I could find friends, I don't. So naturally <laughs> this whole situation has made me feel kind of bummed out i'm not gonna lie um but 
I have to kind of admit and just own up to it. This is where I'm at in the, at the moment. Um, it's not going to change anytime soon. It probably isn't ever going to go back. That's one thing we can flip in, except um, the same as technology. Once your fucking life goes one way, it's very difficult for it to go back to the other way. And um, yeah, I think that was a good era for me. I'm not going to lie. I had, I had a lot of fun back then. Going to like, you know, I'd be out from like further to Sunday when I used to DJ, when I used to fucking... No, when I, when I, when I was DJing a lot. Sorry, not when I used to... When I, when I was DJing a lot, um, when I was putting on raves and stuff, I'd be out like legitimately further to Sunday every single day, which makes me think that I don't think I could do the, the stuff that I'm doing now when it comes to like, you know the content shit, the same level. I honestly couldn't because I was going out so often. Like that was my only thing that I did. Going out, going out. But I was also still working quite a bunch as well. So that's quite, that's pretty cool in that regard. I was working a bunch. I was going out a bunch. But at the end of the day, you can only do that for a certain period of time. You can't do that forever. And um, obviously in this case that I'm in now at the moment, it's suddenly come to a screeching halt. And now I know if I do want to go out, um, it's going to be have to be the Berlin stuff because that's the only time that I've actually had legit fun in terms of going out because, like I said, there's a lot more time to do stuff. I'm not rushed and I can just kind of take my time with it and ease it in. But the days of me being able to sesh at home, go out and stuff are gone. And it was really disappointing the other day because I legitimately had big plans. I was going to go and go to this fucking party at fucking Unit 58. I had all these things worked out. I had my bike. I was going to go cycle to Unit 58. I was going to then go there for like, you know, two hours or three and then bounce over to Fold and do that shit. Come back with a scene report. Tell you how it was and whatnot. Um, who I liked, who I didn't like and whatnot. But, you know, after a little <laughs> session midweek, I was like completely ruined. And I've only just fucking recovered. I'm like, God almighty, man. And that was absolutely nothing. Like, honestly, nothing. I just can't understand how this has happened. It's really, really disappointing, and I'm really sad, but it kind of is what it is. This is a situation I'm in at the moment. I kind of have to go through it. I've got to go with it, but yeah, man, um, this is where I'm at, at the moment. So if you are if you are in the current situation that I'm in at the moment or you're feeling the same, all I have to say to you is the quicker you accept that your body and you as a person has changed, the better. I feel like uh, putting it off is usually going to lead to... Uh, some further heartache that's probably not needed just accept it it is what it is and try to make the best of it and replace things um in your life with other things or just accept your new life anyway i think that's the other thing as well i'm thinking i'm sitting here thinking i need to replace um the drugs with something else but maybe you just ex you just accept what it, what it is without it you don't need to replace that's just like a chronic like type a type of thing and you have to have something going and that's something i used to do a lot as well because i used to have really that's the whole point of this podcast. That's why this podcast basically started. That's why I actually started making content online because I'd listen to podcasts all the time, especially Joe Rogan and Bill Burr type stuff. And I'd be listening to people talk all the time, constantly. And there's a period of time where I remember I never would have, it would never be dead air in the background. There'd always be music or something happening. Something talk, something, someone speaking, a YouTube video, a podcast or music, always something in the background. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, the reason why I'm doing this, I, why I realized was that at the time, I was doing a lot of self-speak. A lot of, like, ranting and raving, like, just, you know, chronic self-speak. Because I, I guess at the time, I was very frustrated with my life and my choices and career-wise where I was and blah, blah, blah. I was just getting really fucking annoyed with it. And I guess in a way to kind of, like, psych myself out and in of states... I would have this weird self-talk about the things I was going to do, the things I was going to say, the things I was going to be doing in the future, what I was going to achieve, all these things. I was, get, uh, I was giving myself all these fucking rah-rah speeches, right? These rah-rah Gary Vee speeches in my head. And I realized, ah, oh, this is what a podcast is. <laughs> it's essentially a mental illness. A podcast essentially is a form of mental illness, especially a solo pod like the one I'm doing. A solo podcast is a form of mental illness that you would sit here, turn a camera on and just be ranting and raving about nonsense shit, or in this case, rambling, um, thinking that anybody cares. This is a form of mental illness. So I thought, okay, cool. If I've got a mental form of mental illness, I'm at least going to make it somewhat productive. I'm at least going to make it somewhat worthwhile. I'm at least going to make it um, somewhat interesting. So let's turn on the camera and let's fucking record. And that's why I basically started shit like this, just because of that self-speak. So as much as the it's kind of killing me at the moment that, you know, the drugs part of my going out has kind of gone, it's also maybe just part of change and part of what it is. And maybe along the way, I'll find other ways of enjoying how I go out. 
Maybe along the way I'll find out that I don't really like going as much as I thought I did. Who knows? But one thing is for certain, it does set me up really well for when I open my own club. When I open my own club, if nightclub eventually, right? One of the things that I was thinking, I was like, oh shit, how can I open my own nightclub if I'm like super in? You know what I mean? If I'm like super in, if I'm like, if I'm like indulging in the effects of nightlife, like how could I do this? And now I'm knowing that I'm, you know, changing as a person and becoming a little bit more mature, I guess in some respects, that's, that's a good omen. That's a good sort of like, uh, that's a good little starting place to come from before opening a club that I can be a little bit detached from it. I could operate it, I could run it and operate it like an actual business person and not just look at it as a place, opportunity to kind of like, <laughs> to have a, a, a basically a place where you can get fucked up and, also, and book people that you like. No, it's actually going to be a business. It's going to be an amazing club. It's going to be one of the best in the world and people are going to love it. And I'm also going to operate it, you know, from like a point of view of actually being a business owner as opposed to being somebody just, you know, lost in the source and shit. So it kind of is what it is, I guess. Um, I have to just accept it for what it is. I'm really, really, um, you know, bit, it's bittersweet time we're in at the moment. But, you know, what can you do, man? What can you do? What can you do? We just have to kind of let it roll. Let it fucking roll. We can't be crying about these things. You know, you got to let it roll. But yeah, let me just quickly mute the mic so I can quickly um, blow my nostrils. Bear with me one second, though. Let's go! Let's go! Agostino is getting old. The things I used to do, I can't do anymore oh no oh no <laughs> oh it sucks so bad man it sucks so bad but again to be fair that's what i get it's my fault for making part of my personality going outside going to club sorry it's not my full personality i'm not out there with fucking body harnesses and shitty pvc pants and shit i'm not doing that but it was a big part of my personality you know, for a long time. Like, if, you, if you've if you been around parts of East London, you'll know, right? My name was ringing out there in these streets for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> my name was ringing in these fucking East London streets for a very long time. In these hipster adjacent East London, South London, parts of North London streets, my name was ringing. If you needed somebody that had a pocket full of MDMA, come to fucking Agostino. Go to that guy, Agostino. He's got fucking... Uh, I'm, 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 that those time I used to win M65. He's got an M65 pocket load, loaded full of MDMA in each pocket. However much you want. You know that famous interview with Lil Got It where he's like, to the, to the interview, do you want a perk? That was me. Do you want a... Do you want a tab? <laughs> ah, that was me. That was me, bro. Do you want a bump? Do you want a bump? What's a bump? What's a bump? Blood, honestly, man. I was out here fucking handing people bear shit. But the funny thing about it back then, right? The funny thing about it, and I think that's something you have to kind of realize when you get older. I was that chronic guy that was tr basically being a bit of a people pleaser with the drugs and stuff outside. And thinking back at it, right? I was like, I'd, I'd have so much shit on me giving to people. And I remember I'd never really got the same amount back. So people would be coming to me for like free shit all the time, but they'd never give it back. You'll never come back. And again, I, I, I never did shit for like, you know, I never did shit so it could be uh, reciprocated in that way. But it is quite a common thing. The guy or girl who doesn't pay for weed and always wants to smoke is also not the person who's going to give you some weed when they have some. It's just always going to be you giving it. So, so. Be very careful if you're that person. If you're that good time person that's always bringing the drinks, always bringing the beers, always bringing the gear, be very careful because you won't realise it because everyone's having a good time with your shit and you feel happy about it. Because sometimes if you're that kind of person, you feel good about making other people feel good so you don't really care. But usually those people will take a piss out of you. They're taking the piss of it. They're going to take advantage of you completely. And they're going to just, you know, you're going to feel, you're going to look back and they feel a little bit used, which I did. I feel a little bit used. I'm shaking right now. <laughs> I'm legit shaking. <laughs> but yeah, big up everybody in the stream chat. Big up every single one of you. Appreciate you for tuning in. Um, yeah, I just had to open my heart out, out there. Just let you guys know that I realized that I'm turning into a square, man. Everything I keep saying about being a normie and raging on normies and shit. 
I'm I'm becoming a bit of a normie myself, mate. I'm becoming a bit of a normie. It's like that quote, in it, right? You stare into the abyss long enough, the abyss starts staring back at you. That's what I'm starting to be. Agostino the normie. Oh, yuck. Agostino the normie. No. Anyway, big up the stream chat. Uche, what are you saying? My my British friend was just reminiscing yesterday of all the fuckery we did in Cayman Islands. It's good to live life, but the party has to stop eventually. Exactly, Uche. Exactly, Uche. Exactly. Exactly, Uche. The party has to end eventually. And you know what's really cruel about that quote? The cruel thing about that quote, because I saw some of you guys saying it before. When I was playing that video of Ricardo Villalobos and Luciano, I was glancing across the chat and I didn't want to read it because it was breaking my heart. But a few of you guys were like looking at it and you were kind of disgusted. <laughs> You're like, these old guys behind the booth, like dancing and shaking. So I was looking, I was thinking, you know, and I watched it again this morning. I was like, you guys were kind of right. There are some, those old dudes behind the booth DJing isn't as cool it's not as cool to other people as it's cool to me. You know, I find it really cool. But I understand if you're a, if you're like a person that's not a regular person that doesn't really care about clubs like I do, you can look at guys who are in their 50s DJing in clubs fucked up. It doesn't really look the greatest, does it? So the cruel thing about the party has to end eventually, what Uche said there in the chat, is that you know what the cruel thing is about it? If you don't choose to end the party, the party will choose to end it for you eventually. Either you choose to voluntarily calm down and go from being at the front of the fucking party, right in front of the booth, to being in the middle, to being on the side, to being right at the back like I am now. Usually from my fold, if you've been able to fold before, it's one of my favourite clubs here in London. And the one place you can always find me in fold is usually under the air conditioning. Because it's the only place that's kind of cool. I remember some kid on some kid on one of the video clips I clipped up on the fucking channel said something to me like, shit, um, you're definitely old as fuck when you start um, complaining about how cold it is in a club or something. I think I said something like that in my review. And I was like, ouch, man, ouch. Like, but he, he was right anyway, because that's where I'm always at in the clubs. I'm very rarely in the middle. Like how I used to be, like getting fucked in the middle. I'm usually on the sides, like with my own space. Because Fold had this really nice little platform on the side you can stand on. Where all the kind of hot, cool gay guys are on with their tops off. And that's me with my fucking big ass in between them, right? <laughs> so I'm either there or I'm under the air conditioning at the back. So that's where I'm always at anyway. So eventually the party has to end in that regard. Because you have to kind of go from the front to the back. But if you keep staying at the front. If you're an old man or an old woman out there and you keep staying at the front. Eventually, the party will end for you because the the kids around you will be, will be annoying you, which are not annoying you. They're just being young. And eventually, they'll push you to the back. So it's either you voluntarily walk to the back, figuratively, figuratively speaking, sorry, or the kids push and elbow you and side to side stomp you out to the fucking sides, right? And you start feeling inadequate. You start getting bitter. You start getting hateful. You start saying like all these other old fucks on social media, complaining about the kids. They play the music too fast. It doesn't have any groove. It's just boom, boom, boom. No, you old fuck. It's not the music. It's you. You're expired. You're tired. Step away from the front. Go and listen to some minimal. Go and chill out and listen to some ambient shit. Whatever you need to do. Or just go to the raves like I do and stand at the back. But I really did understand it, honestly. When you guys were saying it at the time, I didn't want to speak about it because it was breaking my heart. But I did truly understand when looking back at it, when I showed this clip here on screen, <clears throat> where some of you guys are looking at it thinking, Ugh, this isn't the most attractive thing in the world. This doesn't actually look cool as it does. Because both of these guys, Ricardo Villalobos and Luciano, as featured in this video from Luca Dia, I'll take a sign off here. They're like in their 50s, right? So seeing this video of these guys in their like 50s or whatever, um, raving, dancing, having a good time <laughs> behind the booth, it was kind of a bit of a wake up call of like, okay, cool. As amazing as it is, legendary as I think they are, there is a part of it where you're like, don't you get tired? Don't you just want to be at home with your kids and shit? Don't you want to be on a lake somewhere fishing? Don't you want to be building furniture or at all the very least designing club clubs, interiors and shit? Isn't that a more better place to be than to try and be in the middle of the dance with all these other people? Maybe, maybe not. But one thing for certain, I'm definitely not going to be that person still flipping getting on it in these clubs, you know, in, in the ages that these guys are at. If I'm in a club, I'm there to, you know, muck around, have a good time, dance and shit. But I'm definitely not doing it to get absolutely trolley because unfortunately my body can't handle it. And also... I just think it's lame. I'd much rather choose when to kind of bow out gracefully out of that part of my life. I don't want to, you know, 
have the rave choose it for me. That's what I don't want. I want to choose when to end it. And I think this is the perfect time because at the moment, like I said before, getting on it at home, getting on it on a casual one, going to clubs and stuff, that's already breaking me. But if I go out to other places around Europe where they've got, you know, longer hours or opening times and I'm able to go, like, you know, when I go home, I'm like an old man, literally. I'll go to Berlin. I'll sometimes stay. I remember the first four hours I go out there, I'll be out there in Berlin for the first four hours of Berghain. I've not taken it. I've not had a, sim, a single sip of alcohol or done any drugs or anything. I'm just literally enjoying the vibe, speaking to randoms and dancing, right? Having a good time. And then by that time, I'll be a bit tired. I'll go out, get some food. I'll, I'll eat, I'll sleep until like nine in the morning, wake up, go back to the club again, right? And then, then I'll start going a bit crazy then. But still, I'm able to handle it because I'm having little naps and little breaks. I told you already. I told you there was a time. Um, I told you there was a time, right, where I used to... No, there was a time... Hold on, hold on, what, what's I'm saying? Sorry, let me, before I remember. What's Natashki saying here? Natashki saying, no, it's not the music. I've never liked straight oops, oops music since I was young. That's almost embarrassing. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, fair. To be fair, I, I, I understand it. I understand it. It's, it's been a part of me and what I've been into for a long time. And I think for me personally, my story of coming into like dance music, electronic music has to do a lot with like how I was kind of brought up in the area that I lived in because I kind of felt a little bit closed in and I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things and stuff until I got older. I felt like going to clubs was like an escape from my regular day-to-day -day life. It allowed me to kind of have another, another place to kind of dream and explore and blah, 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 you know? So when I see clubs, I see them more as a form of... Um, literal escapism as a, as opposed to seeing it purely as a place to just be there like dancing and shaking my body all around it's not always to do with that it's sometimes it's just to be an escapism have a good time enjoy myself and then kind of go from there personally 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 um but yeah man i don't know i get it now i get it look i get it look at the video how it can look for some people from the outside looking in you know what i'm saying because for sure um it can look a bit weird from the outside looking in it could definitely look a bit weird because I guess uh, the unfortunate no, the unfortunate part of dance music as well, unless you state it yourself, most people just assume that you're only going out to get fucked up. That's the only bad thing I think about dance music, especially in the UK. Maybe in Europe it's different because they have a little bit more of an outside festival-y club culture. So it's kind of seen as part of your daily life it's not too uh, not it's not it's not it's not like it's not an uncommon thing to see like you know regular finance guys in spaces to spain france and whatever maybe um going out to clubs getting fucked up and then going right back to work on a monday it's not that big of a deal but maybe here it's definitely seen as a bit of a crazy crazy one isn't it maybe it's seen as a bit of a crazy one i'm not really sure but hey it is what it is what can we do what can we do what can you do what can we do we have to kind of let it keep going what have you saying chat crash 984 <laughs> ah, <laughs> fuck you fuck you crash <laughs> midlife crisis stream <laughs> that's a good point actually i just realized like, i just looked at the timer i've been ranting <laughs> about this for like 30 minutes <laughs> midlife crisis stream confirmed yeah big up crash thank you for the super chat <laughs> All right, cool. We'll leave it there then. It is what it is. What can we do? It is what it is. Um, I realize it. Can't be sessioning as much as I want it to be. It is what it is. Um, what are we going to say here? Ucho is asking me, would I ever go to an event like this sober? Yeah, I would. I've been there a lot of times sober. Like um, the the One of the couple times I went to Berlin or Bergheim recently, actually. I, I told you the story about Bergheim when I went to Bergheim and, and I fell asleep in the dark room. Did I tell you that? So I got tired, right? So I just got tired. So, you know, there's, there's loads of dark rooms in Berlin. And what, there's one specific dark room that's like in, there's like these, it's these cubes. These cubes that are like elevated platforms. No, there's a cube. It's got like an elevated seating area with like a, like a big cushion. And obviously you can close the curtain if you want to, but it's just open. So I just, I was just in there on my phone in, in Berlin, in Bergheim, right? Just, you can still listen to the music because the sound system is amazing, but I was just on there on my phone. And I guess I was so tired. I didn't realize how tired I was. I think I got one of those horrible flights where I left my house at like 6 a.m. in the morning, which meant I didn't wait. I didn't sleep the night before. So I got there with zero sleep. I got changed. I had some food. I went straight to Bergheim. And I got there. I guess my body just died on me. I didn't even drink. I didn't even do any drugs. I did nothing. I think I might have had like one beer, if that. And I think the beer was actually next to me. And I was sitting on the dark room, 
chairs on my phone and I just fell asleep. <laughs> I fell asleep on my own. And I guess someone noticed, no, someone noticed and then they got the security guards to come because I think at the time that was when they were having that GHB spike incident stuff, right? So I guess they were worried and thought I got spiked with GHB or that I had an overdose. I don't know what they were worried about. So I was sleeping and I remember just like someone touching my leg. I woke up and then um, all I see is some big security guard from Burger and they're always big and muscly and shit. Intimidating looking, but always really nice. And he was holding my phone up like this and my phone was all cracked. I was like, oh shit. So I guess while I was sleeping, my phone must have dropped on the floor. And somebody really nice must have picked up my phone and put it on me or something. Like, imagine. Like, imagine how crazy it is. I'm in a dark room. I sleep. My phone out. Um, the security guard wakes me up. and like, are you all right? I was like, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm all right. And I guess they noticed straight away. They could tell by my face because, you know, these guys work in clubs. They know if somebody's high. I clearly wasn't high. I was just literally tired. I woke up and like, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I just, I must have just fell asleep. And I looked at the time now. I think I was asleep for like two and a half hours or some shit. Like in the dark room of fucking Burgain. And then they're like, are you sure? You're you, you right to continue? I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm a bit tired. I'm going to go. And I was like, okay, no worries. And then um, I think um, one security guard came in. I think well, someone from like the head office or something was in there. I was like, okay, it's fine. No worries. Are you, you sure? Okay, I said, yeah, I'm perfectly fine. I just grabbed my shit and I went home. And I think that's what I was starting to realize. Damn, I'm falling asleep in nightclubs. <laughs> I'm falling asleep in nightclubs. This must mean it's the end. We're fast approaching the end. So yeah, I I fell asleep in Bergheim. Um, I've been to places like Berlin. I've gone out to London plenty of times sober. I don't actually enjoy it. Don't get me wrong, but I've done it and it's fine. It's not a big deal. But I'm also a bit worried that if I start doing it, I'll start to quickly realize that maybe I don't like his clubs as much as I thought I did. But let's wait and see. Wait and see. 